and thanks for tuning in to the Oxygen Alliance YouTube channel where we share the concentrated talk virtual meeting hosted every Thursday from 2 to 3 p.m. Central African time. In the talk, we discuss different aspects of oxygen concentrate assessment, use, and maintenance. And please don't forget to subscribe and hit that notifications bell. Thank you for joining us for the first oxygen talk of the year. So as you are all aware, normally we have our concentrator talk, which is brought to you by the Oxygen Alliance, which is mostly focused on repair and maintenance of oxygen concentrators. But once a month, we do a session where we invite experts to join us for anything related to oxygen. And they come and present to us for 45 minutes. And then we have a Q&A session after the presentation. So today it is my pleasure to introduce to you uh, the team from Fritz Stefan. So this is a company that develops solutions for ventilation, anesthesia and oxygen supply. So presenting to us today is Christoph Hassler, who is a product manager for the oxygen supply systems. He has been with uh, Fritz Stefan for the past three years and uh, we indicated, as, as we indicated in our invite, he will be sharing about scalable and resilient to PSA. Um, so yeah, he has a presentation that he has prepared for us. And uh, after the presentation, we'll have a Q&A session. So please make sure that you just note down any questions that you might have as he is presenting. And then at the end, we'll have like uh, 20 minutes or 15 to 15 minutes to just discuss all your questions. So now I will hand it over to you, Christoph, and uh, please share with us what you have prepared. Yes. Hello from cold Germany, 10 degrees outside. I'm Christoph. And uh, as already mentioned, I'm the product manager of a company called Fritz Stefan here in Germany. And uh, as already mentioned too, um, I'm the product manager for the uh, oxygen supply systems here. Um, but Stefan uh, produces also ICU ventilators, especially for neos and infants, but also for adults. And uh, uh, as a second uh, a tribe, we do have the oxygen concentrators, oxygen supply systems. And we're not talking about oxygen uh concentrators for the home care but also some kind of mobile ones containerized systems as well as systems for hospitals and um, thank you for giving me the opportunity to uh, explain our products a bit here of course it is kind of a pr show but uh, i guess our approach is uh, a bit unique and that's why i thought i get in touch with the Oxygen Alliance to uh, to let you know and show you all our products. To the presentation, uh, we'll give you a short introduction and uh, I have also prepared the principles of concentration, which I'm sure most of you are quite aware uh, as you are repairing uh, concentrators already. But uh, so maybe shorten that a bit. And uh, then I will, of course, describe our oxygen supply solutions, which are a bit of uh, outstanding or unique because we have a different approach than most of our uh, competitors and show you some customer references and a little summary. So let's start, start in. Um, so Stefan is producing medical systems since 1978 already. We are here in Germany, close to Frankfurt and um, the oxygen supply systems we produce for over 30 years now, and they are used worldwide in uh, hospitals, emergency disaster, but also in military armed forces uh, on ships uh, all over the world. So this makes us a bit unique because we are, as far as I know, the only uh, oxygen concentrator plant producer, manufacturer that also produces ventilators, ICU ventilators, means we know the theme from both sides. So the patient and ventilation side, as well as the demands and requirements for oxygen. Yeah, as mentioned, so our systems are installed at hospitals and veterinary field hospitals and also on naval vessels. And uh, 
to explain the principles of oxygen concentration, I've prepared a little video for that also. Um, as I said, I may go through it quite quickly because you are most of you are probably aware of how this works. So we talk about a product which is called oxygen 93 and plus minus 3%. And uh, how do you do that? So you take a kind of molecular sieve inside there, there's a little granulate which is called zeolite. And this is all the principle which is valid for all the other um, PC, PSA manufacturers too. You take ambient air, compress it with a co uh, compressor, press it through this molecular sieve, and uh, those granulate, those zeolite, has the ability to filter the nitrogen and uh, CO, CO2, HO2, and let's just uh, O2 and a portion of argon through. And the product which comes out is oxygen 93. The interesting thing is that this process is fully reversible, means this is how our uh, oxygen concentrator modules look like. So we have on the left picture here the compressed air, the ambient air coming in. And uh, then you uh, use one of those tubes to filter the nitrogen and to get the oxygen out here. And the nitrogen will be blown away. And then when once one of those granulate and tubes is full of nitrogen and cannot cannot filter nitrogen anymore, you flip the process and the direction around. You see here oxygen is generated and nitrogen is flushed. And on this picture here, the other tubes active and the red bubbles, they simulate the nitrogen and the blue ones simulate the oxygen. And there the compressed air comes in and uh, you take a portion of this uh, oxygen, which is not filled into the hospital pipeline or to a high pressure booster to fill cylinder, to filter out the nitrogen. This is the module from top. So you see uh, a little portion is used for flushing and the most of it is done for filtering. And now I wanna switch to a little video I've prepared which explains uh, our oxygen concentrator modules a bit more. So you got the modules here, you see the two tubes filled with the zeolite. You have the outlet with the flow limiter, the outlet tube, the control unit, and two electromagnetic valves which open and close those two tubes. You have the inlet for the ambient air, you do have a depleted air silencer and outlet where the nitrogen rich and oxygen uh, low air comes out. So this is the kind of the exhaust, if you like, the valve block for the electromagnetic. And here you see the functionality um, to ensure if there's any condensation in or water humidity, we uh, close both valves at the beginning and the compressed air is just uh, draining all the pot potential humidity and water out of the of the uh, out of the, the, the tubes because this zeolite is very sensitive to water in a liquid form. And then the process starts as I mentioned the blue bubbles are the oxygen and red is nitrogen and you see the nitrogen will will stuck here. And after every nine seconds, you flip around this process and uh, you flush out the nitrogen and generate oxygen with the right tube. And now you see that flushing and filling process. So as mentioned, this process is fully reversible. And this is how PSA works in any PSA system, concentrator, plant, no matter if it's home care or big in, in hospitals or, or wherever. Yeah, we saw this. And now I will show you what is uh, kind of unique to our systems um, by moving my screen to this here. Uh, no, excuse me, where's the other one? I have a nicer, better one, which shows, here it is. 
probably. Yeah, no, it's, I can't get it bigger. So this is a, a normal uh, oxygen concentrator plant for, for hospitals and things like that. And huge or bigger installations, you have a high pressure booster, uh, you have a, a compressor, mostly oil driven. You have a dryer because you work with higher pressure, seven, eight, nine bars. Then you have a, a air buffer tank in the middle, which is the, the, the white one here, the first one. Then you have these two tubes, which are the oxygen generator uh, modules, and they are quite huge, huge, big as tanks. Then the oxygen is generated there, and you have a second tank for buffering this, this thing, and then you can have a high pressure booster to fill it, the generated oxygen into cylinders, for example. So what we do is we take very small intake air piston driven oil free uh, compressors. All our compressors and the whole system is 100% oil free. We work with our modules at a low pressure, which is 1.8 and 2.0 bar, which uh, has the advantage that um, due to less compression, you will not have so much condensation or nearly a very low amount of com condensation. And then with the generated oxygen, we have a post compressor, also piston oil, oil free, easy to maintain, a separate filter in front of it. And you have the post compressor, which then uh, compromises the oxygen, the produced oxygen into a buffer tank about 7.5 or 8.5 bar, at least higher as normal hospital pipelines are. So what we do is we have those little modules little to say they are 40 50 centimeters high and each of these modules produces 10 liters of oxygen per minute and um, give me a second Bob, Bob need to put this here to see if i'm still online yeah i am yeah we put those two modules on a platform for example have two post compressors in front of that those are sucking in the ambient air, press it to the oxygen concentrator module, and the oxygen is generated. And then we have a post compressor, as mentioned, who then comp uh, compresses the oxygen to the buffer tank pressure. And so with this, we are very modular, it means we can also put four of those modules and compressors on a platform, or we can put eight on that, gen generating 80 liters per minute of oxygen 93. The advantage of this is a low pressure, b you have a high redundancy, it means if one compressor fails or if one oxygen concentrator module fails, you can just switch off this compressor and you only lose 10 liters per minute. It means um, if uh, in this case, if the platform delivers 80 liters per minute, then it would be just 70. Maintenance on the fly is possible, it means you can do a maintenance from time to time you need to change piston rings membranes or whatever of this small piston driven compressors eight screws to open it you need 10 to 15 minutes to do a maintenance here and you can do that on the fly switch off just one compressor and just one module will not work the rest of the hospital and the rest of the full system continues to run if you would like to have redundancy in such a system, then you might have to double the big compressor, you have to double the dryer, you have to double all the, the full system. And this is the big advantage of our systems that we are so modular, so redundant and reliant. What we then do is we take those platforms and put them in racks with slide out technology, anti vibration damping if it's in a container or wherever. And so with a 80 liter rack, three times 80 liter platforms in, you get 240 liters per minute of oxygen, 93, uh, which is registered as a uh, uh, as a medical drug, of course, in the pharmacopoeia. Or you can take the small platforms. And this is another advantage that you can extend our systems all the time. Means if you just have one or two platforms, then you can add a platform an addition platform to it or another rack to it. Um, we had that during COVID times when suddenly the oxygen demand was very high in all the hospitals. So all our existing customers called us or many of them and said, hey, I need to extend my, my oxygen supply system. 
And so they just bought another rack or an, some more platforms. So with four of these platforms, which is kind of the maximum of our system, you can have up to 960 liters per minute of oxygen 93. And although I'm a product manager and a kind of a salesman, I would also speak about the disadvantage of our system. The disadvantage is that uh, our size is quite kind of limited, means if you think about 960 liter, you have the full configuration here. These are 96 modules, means 96 post compressors and uh, about 18 of those uh, pre compressors and 18 of the post compressors means even you can do maintenance on the fly that would then need at least one or two days until you started from the first and uh, end up at the, at the next one. So our size is not infinite, then these small modules do not make sense and become a kind of a disadvantage. Um, so that's the, the structure, how our systems are built. We have a module which delivers 10 liters of oxygen. We have the platforms where we mount uh, two, four or eight of those modules on it. We put them into racks of the different size. We can have a rack farm, one to four racks and put it into oxygen buffer tanks. And we have the option to do cylinder filling then with high pressure boosters and reserve supply. I will go a little step back because I forgot to mention something. Our system also uh, does a act, uh, uh, intelligent platform or rack management. Means during nighttime when no operations happen, hospitals do need not as much oxygen as they use during daytime when the operations happen. So for in case if only 80 liters per minute of oxygen are consumed over nighttime, then only one platform will run. And our system, our control unit looks uh, at the operation hours of each platform or each rack and switches on this rack or this platform, which has the lowest operation hours to keep all the systems um, in balance and in the same maintenance window. You do not want to do maintenance this month on this rack and next month or two months later on this rack or platform. So they will all be in the same maintenance window and you can do then your on the fly maintenance at the same time and order parts and all this stuff. So how do our systems look like? We have mobile solutions like this FS20 compact box, which delivers 20 liters per minute. And if you take two of those, then you can also uh, have a high pressure booster, also mobile in the box and uh, fill cylinders from 150 to 200 bar. Uh, we have container solutions and uh, you see a lot of military uh, looking green, uh, red cross uh, systems here. Uh, because of this redundancy and the simple maintenance on the fly, um, our systems are very, uh, the armies do like them very much. They can produce the oxygen in field hospitals on site. And uh, the maintenance is simple. The people got the training, simple compressors, no complicated Atlas, Copco, scroll compressor, whatever. And all our systems do have the NATO stack numbers. And we also do have stationary systems in the basement of hospitals and so on. Those are the buffer tanks. So uh, depending on the size of the system, we do calculate the size of the needed oxygen buffer tank. And if you run such a concentrator system, PSA system inside a hospital or even in a container, um, there's at least in Europe, the law, you should have a second device and a reserve supply of oxygen. We do that with uh, cylinder batteries, of course, Cylinders, our customers can fill with uh, high pressure boosters from their generated oxygen. So they, we are totally independent from cylinder delivery and cylinder industry. And the switch over of our system happens if the oxygen concentration is under 90%. It happens if CO, CO2, which is all measured, is too high. So out of it also fails over if um, there's a power outage. So means if there's no power, which happens some, some, sometime 
from time to time in some countries, especially in Africa, we expire, experience that uh, even with no outage, it will fall back to the cylinder banks and empty first the left bank, then automatically, pneumatically switch over to the second bank so you can replace the first cylinders. And uh, you can also take the oxygen and if you do not feed the hospital pipeline, which is uh, our standard application, but you also can have, if the hospital do not have a oxygen pipeline, then you can have high pressure booster behind that and fill the oxygen from the buffer tank into the cylinders and fill your own cylinders. Again, you're independent from the oxygen uh, cylinder industry and oxygen supply. Those high pressure boosters can fill cylinders 150 or 200 bar. And we have smaller and bigger ones with filling speeds of 33 and 266 liters per minute. And very often the question comes then, how fast will that be? How fast can the small booster fill a cylinder? If we take a 150 bar cylinder, a 50 liter cylinder, so the big size, you got 7,500 liters of oxygen in one of those cylinders. And if you divide that by 33 liters per minute, then it would take 227 minutes, which is divided by 60, 3.7 hours to fill a 50 liter cylinder. This is the, the small booster, which is very, very, uh, very, very uh, small, but also slow, as you see. If we take the, the big booster we also have and ha would like to fill the 7,500 liters, so 150 liter cylinder, and divide that by the filling speed of 266 liters per minute, the big booster can do, then in 28 minutes, so half an hour, a 50 liter cylinder will be filled with 7,500 liters of oxygen. Our control unit, this is the, the newest version, has a touch screen. We also have also a low price, uh, an older system, which has just seven segments and LEDs. But this is the touch screen version. And here you can see uh, a lot of information. For example, you see four platforms. You see that just at this moment, three platforms are running, indicated by this blue circle here. You see the oxygen concentration in the tank the ambient air oxygen concentration, CO... Really no, yeah. Alfred, you, you have your mic on. Can you mute, please? Thanks. <laughs> um, you see the oxygen pipeline outlet uh, pressure. You see the actual consumption of oxygen, which is 256 uh, liters. You can also see if uh, your reserve cylinders, what the status is, if they are full or empty, what the pressure is inside there and also the uh, pressure which goes then to the hospital pipeline. You see if your high pressure boosters are running and how full the cylinders are. Monitored is CO, CO2, concentration pressure and all the things I just mentioned. And this is how a full system looks like. So we have here on the left side the uh, oxygen concentrator. This is our rack with three platforms, 80 liters each, means 240 liters in total per minute can be produced. This will be feed into a buffer tank. We can also bypass always this buffer tank. Uh, if you want to do maintenance here on the security valve or the manometer or whatever, can bypass this. Then the generated oxygen goes to our control panel here. Again, we have two filter systems here, fine filters, filtering 99.9997 of the particles. And you have also two ways here. So the yellow handles show that this way is open at the moment. We have a pressure reducer. The buffer tank pressure is 6.5 bar. And here the pressure will be reduced to the oxygen pipeline, hospital pipeline, which is uh, normally 5 bar. You see this handle is stopped here, this stops. So if you have to do maintenance on this filter, you can stop those, open this way and change the filter, everything on the fly. It goes up to here to a flow sensor. And here we have the two magnetic wells, which switch to reserve supply if necessary. As I mentioned, they switch when the oxygen is not correct. So out of spec of the pharmacopoeia under 90%, 
CO, CO2 too high, if the pressure drops, why ever, if uh, whatever happens, or even if there's no power, then those magnetic valves, one is normally open without power and the other is normally closed without power. So if there's no power, the right one will open and let the oxygen from the reserve cylinder go this way up to the ox oxygen pipeline. Even if those magnetic valves have a problem, we can close the handles here, the yellow one, open this one, and we can bypass that also to have a mandatory oxygen supply by the reserve cylinder, which you have filled. So, because again, during nighttime, if no operations happen, you have oxygen left, then you can take your, your oxygen, open up this handle, start your high pressure booster and fill cylinders too up to eight cylinders at the same time during nighttime with the filling speed I already uh, explained. Further on, we uh, can also have external alarm, alarming uh, devices in the hospital also, and we can also uh, control the air condition. Air condition is a good, uh, a good point. What you need for such a system um, to generate 10 liters of oxygen, you have to calculate that you need 150 liters per minute of ambient air. Means fresh air and cooling is key to all those systems, no matter if it's a Stefan system or one with the, uh, with the conventional, with the big uh, oxygen concentrator modules I've shown before. You always need a lot of fresh air and cooling air. And this is our, our, how our systems can uh, uh, can be structured. Again, the mobile devices, if you take two of those, then one of these box delivers 20 liters per minute. Now we do need two of those if you want to do cylinder filling with the high pressure booster. This is the one who sucks in 33 liters per minute of oxygen. And that's why one FS20 would not be enough. So we need two to generate 40 liters of oxygen to feed the high pressure booster. We have containerized system, fully air conditioned, heating, ventilation, everything's in, which are used in field hospitals where you are up to 360 liters per minute, which is kind of roughly 36 ICU patients or stationary systems on hospitals or naval vessels up to 960 liters per minute. Here I've listed some technical data of the system components again. Uh, you might ask what, what power do we need? So this system runs with uh, 220 volts, but you do need two phases most of the time, depending on the on your fuse. Um, then this 4.1 is not enough for one 16 amp fuse. Just want to mention that. The system have this size, about uh, nearly a meter and 60 to 80 centimeters. We talk about 115 kilos and 146 for the high pressure booster. They operate from five to, to 40 degree. They can be stored. Uh, they operate to a humidity of, uh, of uh, 95% and they can be stored for minus 20 to plus 50 degrees. And here is the amount of cubic meters of fresh air you might need and cooling air. In the transport, they are IP65, water protected, and in operation, IP20. And if you take the container system, we have a little video here, which shows the container inside. Um, so we have, again, 240 liters per minute. The containers, dimensions, the 20 foot co feet container, talk about uh, six tons nearly. And here you need three phases, 400 volt, so 32 kVA of power, uh, 63 amp uh, power, and the rest is more or less the same. If you have a 480 liter system, means two racks of this 240 liters. So this is a stationary system. So without the container, we talk about 1.7. 1,700 kilos. Again, you need to run these bigger systems. You need three phases at least and uh, fresh and cooling air. And here's a little summary what uh, what the advantages of our system and this multimodular failsafe redundant design is. 
Um, you have a supply on demand means once when a platform is switched on or system or platform switched off because the need of oxygen is lower and then it gets switched on because the buffer tank pressure goes down and the platform will restart. After 90 seconds, this oxygen generation PSA process will start. Um, I can mention that this may take much longer in the conventional PSR plant systems with the big concentrator modules. This takes several minutes until this process starts working. can do uh, maintenance on the fly and the maintenance is synchronized. You have a reduced power consumption because only parts of the system will run and not all or every time all the system, just a few platforms or just half of the racks can be uh, extended all the time we can add platforms and racks to it and uh, we can also shape it so it fits into a hospital by the way if the hospital has did rely on cylinders in the in uh, in the past and they have the cylinder banks we of course can use them as our reserve supply then so the cylinder banks can stay and we connect them to our system as reserve supply I would like to show you some customer references. So we have a FS20 compact, not in the military look, on, uh, look and a, on a private yacht and a ship. We have an installation of a FS160 in Ghana. So we have lots of inst installations in some countries in, in Africa. So uh, sun protection is, a, is an argument that helps down, of course, uh, uh, it's against uh, heating up this, com this container and saves energy for the air condition. Otherwise, the air condition um, has to do all the job. We have a UN project in the Central African Republic where we have container solutions installed. Um, so the Swedish army uh, just uh, had a project uh, which is called Resc EU, where they prepare for crises such as, uh, I don't know, disasters, war, or whatever. And uh, this is how a system looks like inside. We have installations in La Paz, Bolivia. Of course, altitude is a, a problem in most of the countries in Africa, of course not. But if you go heavily above sea level, which is here 3,650 meters, um, to be honest, this 960 liter per minute system will uh, probably only generate roughly 800, 820 liters per minute because of the altitude. Um, but the concentration is always the same. I always have to mention that it will always be 93% just the flow. So the outcome, the liters per minutes, they might be reduced. And the United Arab uh, Emirates, we have installations as well as uh, again in Sweden, another system. Here you have the view. This is the little high pressure booster, the small one. Uh, we do have, of course, some military references. This mobile system, due to the Ukraine crisis, is uh, very, uh, how to say, very popular. It becomes in the NATO uh, forces. So we have a Finnish, Swedish, Norwegian, Estonian, Lithuanian, Spanish, Polish, Belgian, Indian, and German army has those systems. And again, it's because of modularity, simple maintain, maintenance, and the mobility which it provides. We also have field hospitals projects uh, for the German army, for example, where we just have uh, full feed hospitals where there is the oxygen generator, cylinder filling area, and reserve supply cylinders, power generator, tents, and all the air conditions too. This is how such a container looks like. You see, we do have the slide out technology here to do the maintenance. What you see here are uh, oxygen concentrator modules, some of you may, may know, those have uh, 12 little tubes and a rotating disc with a stepper motor. Uh, we had that in the past and we're not very happy because of the mechanical parts. And that's why we invented our own made in Germany uh, oxygen concentrator modules. I did show you in the beginning on the simulations with just the two tubes and the two magnetic valves so we do have less less mechanical parts and no more trouble with stepper motors who do not turn anymore yeah this is the container system uh, with air conditioning heating uh, sun protecting roof and things like that 
also stationary installations uh, with oxygen uh, concentrator plants and uh, we also do um, compressed medical air systems but this is a conventional technology we have installations on ships uh, the german navy for example and the british navy has uh, an installation of our systems on their ships a spanish aircraft carrier a uh, Australian aircraft carriers to those. And uh, so this is the summary. Um, so we are compliant to medical standards, the pharmacopoeia, of course. We have the multi multimodular design. We are working completely oilless. F, even the high pressure boosters, all the things are 100% oilless. So there's no risk of oil contamination. All you need is power and air. You are independent from your gas industry and uh, it can be adapted, it can be extended. You have lower running costs and lower maintenance costs because you can do the maintenance on your own and do not have to call any uh, compressor manufacturer to do the maintenance for you. They are proof, robust, and uh, yeah, generate the oxygen wherever needed. And this is the end of my presentation. Are there any questions? Great. Uh, so that was for Stefan. So I noticed there are some questions in the chat. Oh. Um, so I'm just going to read those out, Cliff. I have noted your yeah. time. So let me just read out I see them in the chat. So the first question says, of course, Jerry answered uh, this question, but maybe you might have extra information to add on this one. So he says the compressor looks like the same kind as the bedside oxygen concentrator, isn't it? If so, can it be maintained or repaired with a repair or reconditioning kit to replace the gaskets? So which, which compressor is meant, the high pressure booster or the pre and post compressors on our platforms? I think he's referring to the pre and post. Maybe Hughes, you can just uh, clarify on that one. Yeah, so the, the pre and post compressors can be maintained by you, simple piston. We have maintenance sets for that, the membranes and the, the, the piston rings and what's needed. Um, uh, this is for the pre and post compressors. You can also have a spare, some people have a spare compressor and just take off the four screws, two tubes, a cable put the spare compressor in and do the maintenance then on the on the compressor on the side. The high pressure boosters, you can also be uh, trained here at Stefan to do the maintenance there, which is, uh, I guess, a three days maintenance, maintenance training, because uh, there we talk about 150 and 200 bar and uh, you need to know what you do there. So, um, yeah. All right, great. Uh, so the second question was from Cliff. So I also saw him raise a hand. So maybe they wanted to. So I'll just let you come off mute and ask that question if it's the same that you pasted in the chat. Um, no, it's it's, it's exactly the same. Um, you can you can read it out. That's fine. Thank you. All right. Uh, so his question says the automatic changeover technology I am familiar with is purely mechanical and activates when there is a drop in pressure. However, your automatic changeover technology is triggered when there is a decrease in pressure or purity. Can you provide more details about how your automatic changeover technology works? Yeah, the, by sensors, I go back to the, to the slide where you can see that it is done by sensors. So we have a, uh, a purely pneumatic switchover. Where is that? Give me a second. Come on. Here. Yeah. So those two are working electronically and also uh, they can work. We have a pneumatic solution for that. So those are electromagnetic valves. As I said, the reserve is normally open by without power. And this one, which comes from the uh, buffer tank, which feeds normally the hospital, is normally closed without power. So on power outages, up. those will not get power and automatically the failover to the reserve supply will happen. Um, the control unit has of course oxygen sensors in and does uh, take samples. These are these little black lines here of the product gas and checks the purity, it checks the, um, the uh, 
the uh, uh, concentration and it checks the uh, CO, CO2 concentration. And it also is aware of the uh, pressure here on the pipeline because it, 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 it has a pressure sensor there. And if the pressure on the pipeline drops, it will fail over. If the pressure in the tank drops, it will fail over. Or if the product gas is not, uh, is not in the pharmacopoeia aspects, then it will fail over. To be honest, um, we are not allowed to do that here in Europe, but we do have uh, in Africa in some systems and also in some military applications, we are asked to uh, implement a function that says even if the product gas is out of the pharmacopoeia under 90%, so this is password protected or with a switch key, um, please give us the ability that the system does not fall back to reserve supply. And uh, so we had to implement that for army purposes because they said we do not have an alternative out there in the field hospitals. We may not have cylinders. I don't care if the oxygen concentration is 85%. If I have no oxygen, my patient will die. So uh, please make this thing work even it's out of pharmacopoeia. As I said, this is unthinkable and against any laws in civilian market in, in Europe but armies have their own rules sometimes, as it seems. And so we have a functionality implemented that makes this system run even the concentration is too low, out of spec. All right, great. Uh, so we have a hand from Robert, Jerry, and Kelvin. So we start with Robert, then Jerry, and then Kelvin. Hello. <coughs> yes. Am I audible now? Yes. You can go ahead. Uh, my question is um, on the molecular filters. Mm -hmm. uh, talking about the oxygen concentrators. Mm -hmm. uh, often are those molecular filters are supposed to be changed? Or what's the lifespan? Yeah, we have modules that run up over 10 years, meanwhile, or 15 years. That depends also on the circumstances. So. In hospitals where you have a, a, a controlled environment and uh, you do have a, a constant air condition, whatever, so the environment is there, there's no movement, systems are nearly running all the time, then we have lifetime of 10 up to 15 years, we expired that, experienced that um, on the modular uh, devices means the um, this little uh, devices here, which are moved around and transported heavily by armies in cars and helicopters, then the lifetime might be lower. Uh, we normally do not, uh, how to say, allow a refilling of that because it's very tricky to fill them. You need to have a clean environment. There are also some pistons and, and seals inside. Um, so changing them, uh, refilling them by customers is uh, a thing you can send it over back to us, we will refill it, or you can have an exchange module there. So we do not think customers can successfully refill those things because we uh, had, uh, had experienced a lot of tricky things to, to make those things reliable. But over 10 I've years asked, is, is, is asked, value. I've asked because um, in most cases, you would find that the purity of the oxygen keeps on that dropping with time mm -hmm. so uh that, that that's the reason why i've asked in most cases some uh, oxygen concentrators we, we we are advised to start considering replacing the molecular mm -hmm. field uh between two and five years mm -hmm. just mm -hmm. to ensure that there is the effective performance yeah. It's also a question about uh, uh, the, the, the protective maintenance means how often you exchange those little filters there. And by the way, I haven't mentioned that those filters can be changed even without a uh, screwdriver. Uh, very easy by hand. Those are this, these little filters here, which you can easily open, replace it. And if the filter is dirty and the dust comes in, so dust and water, those are the biggest uh, um the biggest uh challenges to the uh concentrator modules okay. thank you great uh jerry you can go ahead 
Thanks, Maui, and thanks, Christoph, for a great presentation. Um, how do you make sure that the nitrogen-rich gas that's coming from each of the modules doesn't get back into the intake because they're all very close together? Yes, uh, good question. Thank you. Those platforms are closed here, and they do have two ventilators here on the backside. So the oxygen, the nitrogen-rich air, the depleted air, goes into the cassette here and is transported out of the hospital by simple tubes or in the mobile versions we have, then you have a, a, a kind of exhaust tube where you can put it outside the tent or something like that. So as I said, the, uh, the oxygen goes into this little pipeline here and inside the cassette we have, there's the nitrogen rich and oxygen low air, which has two ventilators here and which blow it out. Those cassettes are closed on the bottom. Okay, great. Uh, so Christoph, it seems we have more questions coming in. I don't know if we can hold, hold on to you for a couple of more minutes. Yeah, yeah, no problem. <laughs> All right, great. Uh, so Kelvin, you also have a hand up, go ahead. Robert, I see you have raised your hand again. So I think you come after the others have asked. Yeah, thank you, Maui. And thank you, Christoph, for the wonderful presentation. So I have two questions. Mm -hmm. uh, I have two questions. The first is, um, so what kind of technical support and uh, troubleshooting services do you provide for these oxygen supply systems? And yeah. the, the second question, <clears throat> could you uh, differentiate or how does the cost of ownership for this these oxygen supply systems compared to other similar systems on the market. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, support. So either our support te technicians um, go out and, and do the maintenance, um, but most of our customers like to get a training here and have technical personnel, some of most of you, as I understood, and do their maintenance uh, on their own means, say, by the, just the maintenance sets, the, piston rigs, the membranes, and what's necessary for the pre- and post-compressors and do their maintenance on their own. The modules, normally, you can't do maintenance there. You can reduce the, the flow a bit if, if, if somehow the, uh, the, uh, the, the zeolite is a bit, uh, how to say, contaminated by dust or sand or whatever. So, but on the modules itself, there's no maintenance to do and the compressors most of our customers like to do because it does not make sense that um, it costs a lot of money if somebody from Germany comes. So we do not have uh, service points in Africa or something like that or, or everywhere in the world. We are a company which has 160 employees, so we are not a worldwide company. So either we fly over and do the maintenance or what we and most of our customers prefer you come get a training and do the maintenance on your own and only in case of problems come over or do video conference to help you solving these problems. We have uh, distributors in many countries um, which also are able to do some maintenance um, but this is not how to say not the same in every country. Some distributors have uh, the starters of doing maintenance on their own and some not. Yeah, total cost of ownership, good point. Um, those systems are a bit more expensive than those systems. I'm totally honest because of the redundancy, because of the, uh, the self uh, maintenance you can do. But in terms of, let's say, power consumption, we are uh, absolutely competitive with the conventional ones because of the platform switching and just the, the partial system runtime um, operation. And um, but uh, yeah, we are a bit more expensive. But I'm not allowed to, to name any prices. If you want to have a quote, get in touch with us, and then because it 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 as you see, it it depends on what you like. Yeah. What does a 960 liter system cost with a bigger tank cylinder filling? Yes, no. Which booster type, which buffer tank sizes, and all these questions need to be answered. So I cannot say a, this is the price for a system. 
but normally we have calculations that after uh, depending on the on the price of oxygen cylinders if you rely on oxygen cylinders or the hospital before um, so we have nice uh, sheets I can also uh, in, in terms of uh, kinds of interest I can provide you with those excel sheets where you type in your cylinder price and uh, the liters per minute you need or the amount of cylinders you the hospital is currently using and then the system uh, sizes our system and then calculates the power costs and the maintenance costs are included and normally this curve after three or five years it pays off because of your savings of the cylinder uh, delivery if you compare it with that cylinder delivery where you have continuously fixed cost 20 cylinders each week or whatever and with uh, such a PSA system, you have, of course, high investment costs and then just power and maintenance. Okay, great. Um, so we have another question in the chat. So Mologeta, you come after Christoph answers this question. So it says, does the system provide remote monitoring? Does it alert engineers if there is a fault or provide a platform in which engineers can request the condition of the machine while they are away? Yes, um, the control, um, the control, uh, our control system provides also VPN access, access which is, um, how to say, um, to switch that off. Where is it? Give me a second. A VPN ex access, which is in, in Europe and with MDR a bit uh, difficult. You know, this uh, thing is a, a life critical system for patients and having remote access, especially in Europe, is a bit tricky to uh, sh um, secure that not somebody is hacking in, VPNing in and pressing stop for the oxygen supply, although the system will fall back to reserve cylinders, but this is a scene. But yes, we do have uh, GSM alarms also possibility as it's written here. So you can get SMS on your smartphone and we can also do if the thing is connected to a, a, a oh, network on the internet, you can secure VPN in. <laughs> Uh, great. So, Muluketa, you also had a hand up. You can come off mute. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Christopher. Uh, yes. It was very nice, but even uh, first of all, I learned from uh, Stefanix uh, maybe more than before 10 years or 15 years ago. And I learned a lot on that. So, mm -hmm. I'm working on these areas, oxygen mm -hmm. areas. Uh, I'm happy to, you know, uh, your modules, uh, but it is not distributed in uh, globe mostly. Uh, I have uh, one uh, plant I have sown in uh, Ethiopia, that mm -hmm. was uh, Awasa. Mm -hmm. uh, it is not uh, currently, it is not working. Mm -hmm. There is a big challenge for, uh, I don't know, the suppliers or the other politics, I don't know. But, mm -hmm. you know, the, the, the plant is not working completely. Mm -hmm. Uh, mm -hmm. You know th that is that makes your uh, you know your representation uh, make weaker. <laughs> so uh, uh, you know you have to change your name in that areas because a lot of other companies are coming and uh, uh, making uh, mm -hmm. distributing a pl oxygen plant in containerized or other surface, especially for after COVID, the mm -hmm. oxygen is you know known. Mm -hmm. And there, you know, there are a lot of investment in that areas. Mm -hmm. uh, but you are not even, uh, I have not seen anything when I'm, uh, you know, uh, working in the bid process and other issues. So you are not involved uh, clearly in mm -hmm. that arena. Uh, but my question, the AWASA uh, experience, uh, one is, uh, you know, the plant was, you know, uh, producing some oil in the pipeline. Uh, the compressed the, the 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 filters there is no oil filters no uh, there is you know the, the, there is one compressor uh, the from the each module mm -hmm. the bigger compressor that compressor will help to you know enforce it 
the sum of the uh, the small compressors, the concentrators, mm -hmm. and to push uh, to the piping. Mm -hmm. But uh, with that filters, I have saw the oil uh, one upon a time the the the, 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 the there was a fire mm -hmm. due to that oil. Mm -hmm. So that is one challenging issue for the, the, the that areas. So how do you rectify that problem? That is very old technology. Uh, and but you are, uh, you know, s s still you are working on a remote uh, uh, monitoring system. So how do you rectify that problems? The uh, second one is the pressure. Are... Okay. The pressure, especially, uh, you know, it seems it's, it's similar with the com concentrator, normal concentrator. Mm -hmm. But uh, for this purpose, how do you make it your pressure? Mm, it's, it's four or three point eight or something like that, uh, four or seven like that. Mm -hmm. uh, sometimes the plant requests six to six, three to six or seven or something. Sometimes mm -hmm. they will have a compressor has ten, uh, you know, uh, bar. But how do you your your compressors each each and every uh, modules have uh, the pressure? So the the normal compressor is very less uh, co uh, pressure mm -hmm. uh, to make to as a plant uh, or developing or providing. Uh, this type of things. Mm -hmm. So uh, this is my question: the pressure mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. the other issue, the technology in, improvement mm -hmm. before fifteen or twenty years. Yes. Thank you very much. Yes. So uh, to the oil question, I, I, I'm confused because all our compressors are oil free, so there can't be any oil inside the the, the compressors. If you have the conventional systems. All the driven scroll compressors or whatever, you have an old separator and you need a dryer. And due to the fact that we work with this low pressure, one to two bar um, for the oxygen concentrator modules, um, and all our compressors are 100% oil free. There, there is no oil nowhere. So we do not need an oil separator or something like that. And to your question, how do we get to the to the pressure we need for the hospital pipeline or for ICU ventilators? This is this little compressor here on the platform. So this post compressors suck in the ambient air, press it to the molecular sieves with around two bar. Then you got the oxygen generated here in this pipeline. And this pipeline ends up here at the post compressors. And those are also oil-free driven compressors, which then ensure the uh, compressing to the to the pressure of the of the buffer tanks, uh, which is about uh, seven point five or six point five bars. So this are, is what the post compressors do. Those ensure the uh, pressure you need for the hospital pipeline. And the second question was. Um, about uh, the oil compressor and the other was about what was that sorry i, I missed the line Your i think you've answered both questions actually both okay yeah that the, the second question was how do you get your pressure we do this with the post compressors uh or, or on on each platform which are both also oil oil free I think Mulugeta was suggesting that in some systems they might need up to seven bars or something. And That's he was no saying problem. this is just, yeah, okay, fine. Thank you. Yeah. In standard, we have 6.5 bar in the, in the, in the tanks, but we uh, have also 7.5 and 8.5 bar. So those post compressors are able to increase the pressure to uh, the tank pressure up to 8.5 bar. This is the maximum I've, I've seen because 10 or 11 bar is the used security valve there. And uh, as I said, whatever hospital pipeline pressures needed, this will be done here with the pressure reducers, which are here. Normally it's five bar for hospital pipelines and ventilators. And if the pressure drops under 4.5 bar, I don't know, because a, a hose to a ventilator was pulled out or something like that, then it falls and if the tank pressure goes down under 4.5 bars, it already falls back to the reserve supply cylinders. Yeah. Thank you so far. You're welcome. All right, great. Uh, so Charles, you raised your hand before and you jumped off, so I'll let you go first. Uh, I see Robert also has a hand, but Charles, you can go first.
Charles, if you're speaking, you're on mute. Yeah, sure. Okay, I was trying to unmute. I was finding some technical problems here. Okay, thanks. Uh, thanks, Christopher, for the wonderful presentation. Um, this looks really very great. Uh, the question which I have is, um, uh, I think with the experience, you, I have noticed that the, we normally have issues to do with the supply chain. Uh, normally, technologies like these ones, they come from outside, outside the country, like in your case, Germany. So the moment that we start, uh, maybe the installation has happened and the machines are running. So maybe something is faulty. We normally find it hard to, to actually find the spare parts locally. Mm -hmm. So I, I, I just like to, to understand from you, uh, I have seen uh, throughout the, the references that you have installed the series of these systems in other countries. Mm -hmm. So maybe just to learn, like, how do you uh, deal with such issues? In a situation that in, we 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 have procured, maybe, maybe the government of Malawi has procured these um, to be used within our country. So, how available are issues to do with the spare parts and the like? And another question, maybe which is a bit tricky. I don't know, maybe if somebody already asked, but it's just about the prices. How much do these cost? Like the tentative price. So that maybe if we report to our bosses, we, we should report with the, the ranges of prices. So this is what I wanted to ask about. Thanks a lot. Yes. Um, yeah, supply chain. Yeah. Uh, difficult question. Africa is a big, big continent. So we have also, we have uh, distributors in some countries who can do our uh, have spare parts and deliver those. We have customers who order when they order such a system, they order two compressors, one or two modules, enough filters or maintenance parts directly with the with the, the investment of the system. So different variants. Uh, we, everything's made in Germany. We have everything in, in, in stock here. And so we can, uh, whatever you need, we can, can send that. Also, uh, you're right, there are some shortages in supplying of parts uh, we do have valves which we buy from suppliers or whatever the tanks and so on um, but you can rely on our our stocks here that we have always or at least try to have always enough in stock here um, there are different scenarios thinkable as i said suppliers do have it in some countries in africa uh, we also have um, a cooperation with uh, two companies who specialized on doing uh, hospital pipelines and all the money falls for the beds and uh, things like that. And uh, to the prices, I can say, give me a second. Um, yeah. difficult depending on the size i'm normally not allowed to to say something about prices because of because of uh, distributors and things like that and um, but i may may find some prices for you mm -hmm. Right, so as Christoph is looking for that, so I think we just have three more minutes. We're already way past our time. So Roberts and Cliffs, you have your hands up. So I think uh, we we'll start with Roberts and then Cliffs. So just uh, do a quick one and then Christoph, you can just. Uh, thank you once more for calling me an opportunity to ask another question. By the way, I forgot to even uh, appreciate your presentation. Mm -hmm. That was presented, and uh, my question is: Since through your presentation, you are you you are mostly emphasizing on the equipment uh, being kind of acclimatized to the uh, European uh, environment. How are they tested? 
to withstand the rugged environment, especially that of Africa, that is one, one question. And uh, you understand every capital investment, there they, they is an unexpected return that is, uh, uh, return that is uh, anticipated. And with the with 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 that in mind, what measures have you put to ensure that they, you provide competent after sales services, understanding that these are critical equipment that should not be allowed to have a longer downtime uh, downtime in terms of intervention. Um, after sales interve after sales interventions, mm -hmm. how equipped are you? Because we are talking about countries such as Malawi, Zambia, uh, all over Africa, and mm -hmm. then you have a channel partner that is handling the service based mm -hmm. in Kenya, for lack of better terms. These mm -hmm. are critical um, critical uh, equipment for facilities. Mm -hmm. um, what plans have you in place to ensure that you, you you reduce on that downtime in an event where there is such crisis and then uh, you are able to send the engineers or the field service engineers to go and uh, address that issue? Uh, by the way, I've been in this field for close to uh, 14 years now. Mm -hmm. um, I've been multi-modality uh, practitioner uh, so uh, I'm basing my questions from that background of experience thank you yeah as I said um, there are many possibilities either we do service we have about five service technicians flying around everywhere we have uh, competent partners and distributors in some countries who do the maintenance and spare part uh, delivery or what most of the customers and also we prefer if uh, you send trained stuff over or uh, to get trained here or we send a technician there to train stuff on site to do the maintenance the downtime of the system is relatively low because uh, of this redundancy yeah if a compressor doesn't work you lose 10 liters and if another doesn't work you lose another 10 liters so there there is no real uh, single point of failure maybe the control display part which normally not breaks and doesn't break very often so yeah it's made in germany we have a uh, spare here we can come fly over to do maintenance and 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 uh, uh su support we um have partners in some of the countries not in all of course distributors who are able who are trained to do maintenance and service for those systems and the best thing would be if somebody on site can do the maintenance and get strained either in germany or on site there right great uh robert you can also just quickly ask your question oh sorry cliffs oh i'm just from asking thank you Okay, um, thank you. Um, thanks, thanks, Christoph, for, for a very detailed um, presentation. Um, um, could you please uh, provide information on, on power consumption of your plant, ranging from the 20 liters per minute to, I think your um, highest consumption is uh, um, 90, 960, 960 liters per minute, right? And uh, you also mentioned that the operational cost of your plants is lower than that of other plants. Um, I would like to better understand how the power consumption of your plants contributes to um, cost savings, because mm -hmm. uh, electrical cost um, in terms of PSA plants mm -hmm. that really drive um, the cost of oxygen up. So PSA plants becomes more expensive than um, liquid oxygen mm -hmm. because of um, electrical costs. Can you um, please summarize that for me? That's okay. Thank you. 
Yeah, so to the pricing, um, let's say a, a stationary system FS240, which is one of those full size 80 racks, 80 liter racks, uh, 80 liter platforms, um, 200 liters per minute, so roughly 24 intensive care patients, if you like. We calculate 10 liters per minute per intensive care patient for normal ventilation, it's roughly 150,000 euros. One five zero thousand euros FS two hundred forty. This is um, the rack, the buffer tank, control panel, and uh, reserve supply cylinder filling not included yet. Um, this is a price example for two hundred fifty, uh, two hundred forty liters per minute system. And to power with respect to power consumption, uh, I would like to say that um and the tco we can get in touch afterwards and and uh talk about that um in terms of power consumption i can i have those slides which is three phases approximately 49 amps so a fuse of 36 amps so it's 32.6 kva for such a fs240 container system including an air condition yeah so 400 volt three phases 32, 33 kva yeah thanks sir um, my, my answer is actually on this slide i i missed this slide yeah thank thanks christopher yeah in and also the mobile ones um we have all the technical data here and also for stationary system which yeah. okay all right. Uh, thank you very much. I think we are way past our time and we need to wrap up. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah. Uh, thank you very much, Christoph, for the presentation. Uh, it's been really detailed and very interesting. I'm sure most of you enjoyed it because obviously we got a lot of questions. So it shows that uh, everyone was following through. Uh, so in case you have more questions that you'd like to ask you can send them to us at our email address that we have pasted in the chat or you can send those directly to christoph christoph is it okay if i paste your email in the chat of course yeah so you can either send them through us and then we'll forward them to christoph or you can even get in touch directly so christoph i'm also going to paste a question in the chat that i missed somehow so maybe uh, that can also be responded through email yeah I, i'll have a look and go through it all right great thanks uh so thank you very much everyone for joining for those of us who uh joined for the first time please just share with us your email addresses thank you thanks christoph thank you goodbye thank Bye -bye. you for your attention you, and your interest ciao yeah sorry about that yeah so i think uh we're gonna all jump off our, our, the call now so we'll get in touch with you through email on uh the next uh oxygen talk call so please make sure you share your email addresses with us before you jump off